Hey guys, this is Hendry from Cape Carnivores, and today I'm going to show you how to grow carnivorous plants indoors. I'll take you through my setups, my lighting, some of the plants I'm growing here, some tips and tricks for success of growing these amazing plants under artificial lighting conditions. Let's take a closer look at my first shelf over here, the Sunday shelf. So now with a bit of a closer view of one of my shelves, you can get a general feel of the growing space. This is a wooden shelf that I built out of an old bed, some shipping crates, various other bits and pieces. It pays to be DIY savvy in this hobby. There's lots of pre-built shelves available that you can make use of. I use a plastic tray. This is a Garland brand tray made in the UK from recycled plastic. Very neat, very long lasting. I've had some of these now for almost five years and they work stupendously. They can sit in the sun, they can sit wherever you want and they don't break. And they work really well for the carnivorous plants because you get them in various sizes from 60 by 60 all the way up to 1.2 by 1.2 meters. So you can kind of fit them in any grow space. So I'm growing mostly sundews in here. They're one of the plants that really responds well to artificial lighting. So they just look, just look much nicer than the plants outside do. They grow very gently, they get very dewy, and they're not exposed to the harsh environmental conditions outside. I'm currently recording this video because it's storming outside, but it's still nice and cozy in here for the plants. They're not getting rain on, they're not getting blown around, which is pretty beneficial for some of the more picky species. Now, I grow a variety here, such as Drosera tocaensis, Drosera capensis. I have some South Americans like Drosera grama galensis at the back. Larger capensis, latifolia, rubrifolia, natalensis, affinis, hilaris, and the list goes on. So I'm growing them on this shelf under a Migro A-Ray. It's quite a high-end light. It's primarily used for cannabis. It's very bright. As you can see, these are only running on 40% is more than enough for the plants in this space. If you hang them higher, you can run them stronger over a bigger area. One of the key considerations for growing carnivorous plants indoors is the lighting. Because carnivorous plants, as a general rule, grow in very bright places and very wet places. There are, of course, exceptions, and those can be catered to. But you want to blast them with almost as much light as you have available. If you don't have enough light, they often get quite leggy and quite green. And you see poor growth, they're more susceptible to pests, and so on. You don't need specific lights. I've spent a long time growing under plain white T8 tubes, LED tubes, which I'll show you soon. These I just happened to get from a friend. Thank you, Alex Dietrich, for donating these to me when he left South Africa. And now they work stupendously for color. As you can see, this part of Drosseratocansis is very deep, reddish, or well, some plants still stay green if they're not particularly inclined to stay red. I also grow some Cephalotus under the lights. This is Cephalotus follicularis. Lovely little plant I'm currently testing in cocoa. These are apparently better grown outside, or at least exposed to seasonal variations to get their normal dormancy cycle. As for substrates I use indoors, I try and use long, longer lasting grittier mixes. This helps them retain water a bit better and aerate a bit better than pure peat based mixes. So most of these plants are in a mixture of peat and sand. I use fine quartz silica sand, you often get as pool filter sand, and some of the newer pots of perlite in just to break it up a little bit. I find pure peat stays quite soggy and it molds very easily indoors. You get a lot of algae, let it get a lot of moss, is isn't very pleasant. I've had some of these pots now for three or four years and they're free of moss and algae. That's also due to the fact that I rinse my peat, something I'll speak about in a future video. On the right hand side here, I have some of my propagation containers. This is a method I've been testing lately of water propagation. The sundew leaves, you can see them floating around in here. These I took a few weeks ago and a few are already starting to sprout. There's a pretty slow method, it's one for patience. You can also take root cuttings if you need to. It's a little bit faster but then you have to dig up the plants. So I'm opting for the water, just a few leaves per container. These I took a few weeks ago and I'm getting sprouts on some things like prolifera. For the bigger leaves like a pensus, I use a big container. These are cuttings of the Balischatbach capensis, which is hiding there at the back. Really magnificent plant. They rarely look this good outside just because of environmental exposure. Let's move up to the top shelf and I can show you a few more things I have going there. So now at the top shelf of my grow space, you can see some more of the sundews I'm cultivating, such as Drosera capensis, Drosera emissa, Calenziae. I've got some nice Adelaides in here, and even a few Pinguicula and Utricularia. And they generally look quite good under the lights. I also use it for the tissue culture plants that I deflask because it's much, much gentler on them versus facing outside conditions. In my bedroom right now it's about 23 degrees. 
whereas outside it's 17.8, so I'm getting about a 5 degree Celsius boost on the temperature at the moment. The downside is, in summer though, I do accumulate quite a lot of heat that comes in and stays in through the evening, which can be a problem for more of the sensitive plants that we'll get to soon, but for the sun views, I tend not to mind it so much, so long as they stay wet. I fill these trays and let them out for, dry out for a few days before I refill them. This helps the substrate breathe, because quite often a problem with PT mixes, if they're kept continually submerged, they get very anaerobic at the bottom and it breaks down. This can be a problem for the roots. It smells quite bad, you get kind of a sulfur smell from the pots. So since these are next to my bed, I try and keep them as clean as possible. And having a lot of sand and perlite in the mix also really helps break it up and prevent that from happening. Now we can get a good look at these compensas. This is a deflask I've done for a client. You can just see how much dew is coming off of these. These are only out of the jar for about two or three months now and growing spectacularly. You can see in general the plants on the shelf look pretty happy. I'll have a closer look at some of them later. Let's head down to the bottom shelf where I'm still using T8 LED tubes. So out of the bottom shelf you can see the kind of rack of LED tubes that I'm using. These are simple T8 LED strips inside the tube with a connection on the other end that I've wired up. So I've got six of them running in parallel. It's about 54 watts of LED lighting for a 60 by 60 grow space. And it works well if you hang it low enough. These are a bit higher just so I can easily get to the plants, but it should actually be lower to get better color. What I'm growing on the shelf is primarily Utricularia and Pinguicula. So in front here we have some Utricularia species Hermanus. Very nice grassy attractive species, has deep purple flowers. In cultivation it's called Biscomata var esterhe sinie. Well, it's not quite a Biscomata. I also do Drosera seedlings down here. This is some Drosera zerophila and Glybrypi seedlings hiding behind here. I like the salt trays because you don't waste too much space. But being, and also being as wet, you get better germination on the seedlings. But it also attracts a lot of moss with the moisture. Over here, a few Pinguicula in the more sandy mix. Some Condoi from Diflora in Italy. Various other bits and pieces. This is a mix I've been trying. It's primarily comprised of sand and perlite with a bit of old pumice and peat mixed in. I really don't like a peat heavy mix. Quite often lets them rot. And a few Drosera D flasks, which unfortunately are quite sad looking. This is Drosera cystophora varhelianthemum. I'm getting a lot of problems with fungus, as you can see in the pot next to it, where pretty much everything has died. It's a work in process to figure out the tissue culture plants, but I'll get there eventually. You can also grow sphagnum moss pretty easily in the trays. I just leave it and it grows. Just make sure it doesn't dry out completely. So that is the first shelf. I'll move over now to the Heliamphora tank. We can get a good look at how we grow some of the more difficult plants in South Africa. So here we have what I would consider my tropical tank. It's mainly for my Heliamphora, my Nepenthes. So there's some nice big Heliamphora here. The Nepenthes are a bit more hidden. I'll show you later. So this is a 75 gallon or 250 liter aquarium I've converted for this purpose. On top, I have my two older racks of T8 LED lights from the bigger grow shelf. And inside, I keep all the plants. What I've done to keep it humid and to create a water reservoir for my irrigation is I've stacked some egg crates on top of some pipes in here. So I get a nice, big, flat surface for the plants to sit on. And all this under here is water. I'm not sure if it's visible in the video. It's due to how dark it is. And in the top, I run an irrigation system to water the helis because they like to be top watered and get water into the pitches. And with me being away quite often studying, it's easier to have a system I can activate from my phone. So Heliamphora I primarily grow in pumice. I did add some peat, but I'm not sure how much of that is left. And they seem to like it because it stays moist and it drains well. But it's not waterlogged. They're not so much like Saracenia that they want to sit in water in my experience. I have some along fibers sphagnum moss as well, but it gets pretty gross in here just due to how humid it is all the time and how wet it stays for a long period. On the right hand side of the tank I keep a fan for airflow. The eventual plan for this tank is to make a proper lid for it with fans blowing in and fans sucking air out. Because humidity without air movement is a great way to get mold. And so far I've avoided that in this tank. The humidity stays quite high at about 90%. And the temperature is a little bit lower than ambient, but I'd also like to do evaporative cooling for summertime when it's getting 30, 35 degrees here in Dermal, which is something a helium for a really hate. So you can see this starting to grow well now, like this minor, I have Heliamphora McDonald Day, 
Huberi, Mina, Newtons, Heterodox, so quite a few different species in here. And some nice Highland Nepenthes, which I'll show off a bit later. We need some Velosa hybrids, Raja Cosmolis, Albo Marginata, Lowei, and so forth. I'll demonstrate the irrigation and the control system that I have in place. Let's just get it open on my phone for you guys. So using the Sonoff system, the app Ewe Link, I can control the lighting. So for the helium for a tank, I can turn it off. Back on again quite easily. Let me show you the irrigation system as well. I press the pump, it's going to be very noisy. This is quite a simple system, you can see it absolutely blankets the area. Let me bring the pump out for you and show you how it works. So this little guy in the corner here is a high pressure 12 volt pump. It pumps at about 6 liters per minute. You can lift up to 90 meters actually, which is quite impressive. The shoes are quite a high pressure, so I have water coming in on the one side and out the other. Make sure you use your metal hose clamps, as I did not the first time, spraying water all over my wall. You can see in here the fan, and the bottom I have a water intake, a water filter, just to make sure no sand or anything gets in. And my fogger disc there, which I'm not currently using. And on the top of the tank, I have the sprayers. I'm using these 360 degree sprayers. Before I had little, also 360 sprayers, but I sprayed individual lines rather than carpeting an area. And it resulted in me losing some pretty nice plants, such as a hamata, because they weren't immediately under the line of spraying. You can see the heliamphora quite happy in here. Some Nepenthes are also here on the side, such as this Raja Cross Mollus from Nils Plants. This Alba Marginata Black from Green Jaws in Germany is recovering quite nicely. Alright, in the back corner is a Velosa Hybrids from Jeremiah Harris. I'll show those off soon, but first, I'll show the Pinguicula shelf, the last part of my indoor growth space. So here we have the last part of my indoor growth space, the Pinguicula slash Jurassic shelf. So this is also using LED TA tubes. There's four on the top shelf and two on the bottom shelf. Still gets quite nice color on the plants. And I also have a humidity dome in here for my more rarely sensitive Drosera, such as Drosera prolifera, Schizandra, Magnifica, and so on. I got these little trays with a shelf and everything from a grower who was emigrating. And I use an aquarium light up here from an aquascape I still haven't made. I'm sorry, Ethan. To keep my pinguicula pullings, I do in little bags. It's something I'll make a video about soon. So pinguicula like to be kept a little drier than the drosser, which is why I grow them mostly on their own. They like to dry out for quite a few days between watering, especially in winter when they're in the dormant succulent phase. The mixture I'm using at the moment is mostly vermiculite with some perlite and some peat. It's not something I'm very fond of, as it breaks down quite badly, something I'll show closer up. I'm, so I'm going to start experimenting with akadama based mixes. The Japanese rocks seem to work really well for the pinguicula. The vermiculite, while it worked at the beginning, it's cheap, it's easy to make, it's nice and porous, it really does not last very long at all. This little humidity dome, it's just a little basic cheap jobby. If you look a little closer, see this don't hold so many plants, but it's a very valuable space to have for more specialized things, which I'll show you now. So just have a closer look at what I'm talking about on my shelf here. Got this pot of Gypsocolor cross Sethos Pinguicula. You can see the surface is pretty like mucky. It's dark, it's not very nice, it forms a very hard layer. I think it's from the peat, from the humic acids that really build up. And the vermiculite just breaks down and gets quite sludgy over time. It also releases a lot of magnesium, which is quite a problem. Some plants, like this Pinguicula hertiflora, that I grew from seed, there's only one tiny little bit left. The medium has just been breaking down, and they really don't like it. Other plants don't seem to mind it too much, but I try and avoid it now if I can. In the middle, this is my humidity dome area, removed for viewing purposes. I keep my more difficult sundews, such as the two of the Queen's ancestors, Drosera prolifera and Drosera schizandra. I got these earlier this year, and so far they're thriving in here. There's some sphagnum moss and perlite, and a little bit of water in high humidity. They don't seem to mind the bright light at all, despite reports I've heard that Drosera prolifera no, sorry, Drosera schizandra wants to basically be left under a table, light-wise. I've also got a few Drosera magnifica. i got a bigger plant that died back, but now, like many sundews, 
It's taking the opportunity to go back from the roots. These are also repot into a more Akadama Kanuma based mix. These grow in fairly well draining sandstone slopes in South America and really don't like to be, I think, as wet as this one is. This is just what I had at the time. Also, I have some rare South Americans like Drosera Campo Repestris. Really nice but slow growing species. The smaller one died, but the bigger one is going on. I need to figure out what mix is ideal for this old guy so he can grow a little bit better and a little happier. And the last, most interesting thing I have in the humidity dome is the Tricularium monolinaformis. Really doesn't look like much right now. There's a few little green leaves. It's a Sri Lankan endemic grown by my friend Fraser in Scotland. And like most Utricularia, it's doing a lot of work below ground before it starts growing up top. That's like the one growing next to it. Utricularia prey longer. So this is the leaf in inverted commas because Utricularia don't really have leaves like you would consider on a normal plant. These are a modified stem. The actual leaves form into the, the traps underground on the stolons. So they have highly modified leaves for trapping, and what you see it's photosynthetic is actually stems. Weird, I know. And unfortunately you do lose plants even under lights, like Astrocera bicordii, very nice African species I got from Diflora, but unfortunately it just did not make it. The pings can still be happy in the vermiculite mix, these ones look a little better. The nice little flowers, a lot more on the lower shelf which I'll show you now. But I'm due to repot all of these. So you can see just how easy it is to grow some of these plants under standard lights. Some of these are the more pink grow lights, some are white, that's how I got them. But even just normal white lights work perfectly. Going down the shelf, we have what's left of my Pinguicula collection. Some interesting ones like Cyclosecta, Agnata, Jamavensis, which I think is an Essoriana synonym now, so it's not actually its own species, it was currently or previously recognized to be different, but now we think it's the same thing. A lot of smaller ones, they don't need huge pots, so root systems aren't super extensive, but I suspect the poor quality of the, the vermiculite mix does not help in that endeavor. And also on the side here is where I grow my Nepenthe seedlings. You can see a little sea of green there. This was a method that was taught to me by John's Connors in Vienna. So here we have a nice pot full of little Nepenthe seedlings. This is his Nepenthe's Vitri cross. You can see they're germinating very well. So in long fiber sphagnum moss and perlite, I chopped the sphagnum moss using a blender, put in here the label and the sowing dates. This is the 28th of July, 2024. And three months later, they've germinated beautifully. The bag helps keep some humidity, but it's open at the top just a little bit for airflow. If it dries out, you can water them again. If you keep it completely sealed, you get a lot of moss, you get a lot of fungus. It's really not ideal. But they grow well under the lights, you'll see like the pinguicula, and soon I need to prick them out. Something I'll show in another video. So that's it for the main part of the grow space. You can see the back here growing together. I'll find some of my most interesting plants to show you. Just some examples of what you can get done under indoor conditions. That's really the basics of it. Some are open, some need extra humidity. But at the very simplest, a shelf with some lights will be amazing for growing a large, large majority of the conifers plants. You can grow pinguicula, the butterworts, you can grow sundews, vidrosera. You can overwinter your Saracenia trumpet pitcher seedlings, where typically they want a lot more light than you can give them indoors. Same for Venus flytraps. They're really something that in most places you can throw them outside and forget about them. There's not much reason to have to grow them under lights. And the more difficult species like Heliamphora and Island Nepenthes really thrive under indoor lighting conditions. A lot of people use grow tents, something I've not yet tried, because then you can really manipulate the environment how they want it. But as I said, at a very base level, some LED lights and a tray of water goes a long way. Let's have a look at some of the more interesting plants. If you don't want to look at those, thank you for watching this far. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more videos about carnivorous plants. So let's start off very simple with some of my favorite indoor carnivorous plants that I'm growing. Yeah, I have a nice big pot of Drosera tocayensis, a natural hybrid, I believe, between spatulata and oblanceolata from Hong Kong, if I'm not mistaken. So this is one of my first pots of conifer's plants when I started out a few years ago, back in 2020. And let's put it this way. I sowed this pot full of seeds, not knowing just how many would germinate, and now I have this huge pile. So in a 9cm round pot, 
and the entire thing is coated in plants. You can see all the old flower stems coming out here. Tarkansis is a weed, so I do not let it flower under any circumstances unless I want to collect a little bit of the seed. If you're already starting out, this is a great one to grow. Almost everyone has it or has seeds of it. This is because it's such a vigorous, vigorous natural hybrid. So that's one of my first plants, the one that's still going. It's not something I've repotted because you can't really repot something like this. But they don't seem to mind being pot bound as a small plant. Maybe they have shorter roots and some of the other South African sundew species that I typically work with. Let's move on to the next one. Here we have Drosera hilaris, a South African summer dormant Drosera species. These are still quite small since they came out of my tissue culture. This only not even two months ago. These are some of the only ones that survived. If you remember on the bottom shelf, I had a lot of problems with fungus. Even some of these plants are dead. I've got a few now that are growing nicely. They need to be repotted soon. They're typically much bigger plants. They get about so tall. In the wild, 20 to 30 centimeters. Only part of which is a growing head because they form a long stem over time. So these are pretty nice. I've got them in a very sandy mix. I'm going to plant them out soon into taller, sort of 15 centimeter sapling pots. So these have a very deep root system. I reckon these plants have already hit the bottom of the pot. And in my experience, when Sundays get root bound, they start throwing pretty weird growth. They don't grow very well, and they're a bit of new substrate. Really does them wonders a lot of the time. Growing next to Hilaris is my Cocoa Husk experiment. So here we have a Cephalotus folicularis and a Drosera capensis. Both growing in a mixture of two parts Cocoa Husk, Cocoa Qua, and one pot Perlite. And most experienced carnivorous plant growers have known that cocoa qua can be quite problematic. It's often grown in areas close to the sea, in Sri Lanka, in India, and elsewhere in Asia, and thus has a very high sodium salt content, sodium chloride usually, from sea spray. And for many plants, it's not really a problem. They can tolerate salts, but carnivorous plants with a very sensitive root get burned pretty much immediately. So when I had an opportunity to get some washed, graded, and buffered cocoa qua, I thought it's worth giving it a shot. So if you look a bit closer, these are fairly large chunks, it's mostly chunks and fibers, but it's graded to about 6 millimeters in size, so you get don't really get all the very fine stuff and you don't get the massive stuff. According to the salesperson from the substrate warehouse, this drains very well, it's very airy, even compared to the chunky mixes, because there's not so much space for things to settle between the individual parts of cocoa fiber. And I planted these two months ago as well. And so far, they're growing exceptionally. This plant over here didn't really have any pictures. And this Capensis is about tripled in size. So it's very promising for a test. I need to leave it for a bit longer before I can be definitive. But I've been using this now for my Nepenthes outside as well, and it's working superbly. But if you use Cocoa Qua, you need to make sure it is washed thoroughly and buffered. So I think for these, they use calcium nitrate, which may actually be toxic to carnivorous plants, but definitely less toxic than sodium salts. And sundews are typically pretty fragile to environmental disturbances, so if there are problems, they'd probably have shown them by now. On the other side, Drosera capensis is quite a tank, and I should test it with more sensitive species. So use this advice with a grain of salt, and always test new things on a few sacrificial plants before you move on to repotting everything. I've done that before with pretty disastrous results. If the mix isn't ideal, such as unwashed peat, and then I got a lot of humic acid burning on some of my nicer species like Grama galensis, which I'll show you next. So here's my Drosera Grama galensis. It's a South American species, and very beautiful. It has this nice sprawling leafiness. It has very hairy undersides of the leaves, which is pretty interesting as a South American species. It is beautiful. It likes to grow wet-ish, but at the back, you can see the old ones. So these I potted into substrate with unwashed peat, and they got humic acid burn and they pretty much died immediately. There's some sprouts coming out of the roots. So a pro tip for sundews in general is if they die, leave them be for a while. There's a good chance they might come back from the roots. Or you can dig it up and take root cuttings. This species hasn't grown to full size for me in this mix of peat and sand. I think it might like something a bit looser, like long fiber sphagnum moss. Something I just don't use that often due to how expensive it is. The Grammar galensis for me so far has been a very easy grower. But it's one of those ones that likes to be inside for the most part. I've tried some outside, some South Americans. They just don't really like the Mediterranean climate here in South Africa. So something best done indoors. Another one of my favorite indigenous South African sundews is Drosera rubrifolia. These are both from the Bainscliff location, the more typical red leaf. Rubrifolia means red leaf. And the albino form, which I found growing alongside. 
and the guy who owned the property collected some cuttings for me out of this albino form. It does not grow as big as the normal ones, because plants without pigment have no way to protect themselves really from photo photoperiodic stress. So if they have too much light, they can't really handle it. And it stuns them a little bit, because the main function of red pigments is to protect the plant from excessive light. These are usually anthocyanins. Get this nice red color for a lot of the plants. If you grow them under too little light, they actually lose the pigment because they don't need it. So a well-colored plant means it's definitely getting enough light, and a light stress plant will start getting a bit crispy. Rubrophodia I found to be very easy to grow. These are just some peat and sand. It grows well from leaf cuttings, grows well from root cuttings. It's quite a boggy species, but very rare in nature. There's only three known sites for it, with the fourth one where it was described from, but we don't know where that is, unfortunately. So if you have an opportunity to pick these up, I can highly recommend it. Drosera slackii is another really good bog species from South Africa, as well as Drosera admiralis, a smaller plant here in front. Slackii is named after Adrian Slack, the famous British conifer plant grower and breeder. It's a really nice, almost guitar shape to the leaves. It's quite reddish. This is probably the reddest plant of the bunch. It doesn't get as red as it does in the wild, unfortunately. Maybe I need to crank the lights up even higher. It has a reputation for being a bit difficult in cultivation. This may be another instance where having lights is just handy. The Admirabilis also look much better than any that I've tried outside. So, yeah, it really goes to show just how effective lighting can be in growing sundews indoors, or just how good indoor sundew growing is compared to outside. If you have the opportunity to get one of these as well, I can really recommend it. They're a bit more expensive because they're much slower growing. These plants are a year and a half, two years old already, and about full size, or in the wild they get even bigger than this. The last sundew from this shelf I'd love to show off is Drosera calunziae. These grow from Iswatini, a small country located within the borders of South Africa at higher elevations. I think they also grow in Gauteng in South Africa, but don't quote me on that. It's a really nice, more compact species with slightly reddish petioles in the middle. These are out of my tissue culture program. Really nice round leaves, long, the long red petioles, very clumpy. A lot of these initial plants died, but now they're growing back in the roots. And they look super impressive. I've also had not much luck with these outside. It's really an indoor baby. And this is the sort of stuff I try and prioritize. A lot of your hardy sundews will do fantastically out here. So I don't really know why I grow capensis indoors. Looking at you, Mr. Barley's Chatbach Capensis at the back. But then again, it does look truly magnificent and much better than many of my outdoor plants most of the year. In summer they get crispy, in winter they get cold. But indoors, they chug along all the time. So that's it for the Drosera. Let's have a look at some Nepenthes and Heliamphora. Starting off strong on the Nepenthes, we have this Nepenthes Raja Cross Mollus from Nels Plants. It's a really cute little Highland hybrid. Probably one of the more expensive plants I own. This is why trading. It's really a fantastic way to get nice plants without breaking the bank. These cute little pitchers. Raja, as a whole, is apparently quite a sturdy species. And Molly's is, Mollus is beautiful. So it should grow really well. I like these little soft plastic orchid cups for the Heliamphora tank. So I can kind of squeeze them between everything else. The problem I'm having with sphagnum moss is all the grass. A lot of sphagnum moss is wild collected. Even if it's farmed, or if it's farmed, there's a lot of grass growing in it. Pull it early, otherwise it just roots in completely. And you're never going to get out without pulling out half your pot. So this pond grows super well in the tank. It doesn't get highland temperature drops. But it still seems to be quite happy. One of my favorite plants from the tank that I'm growing is this Nepenthes Rob Cantlia cross Loei from Andreas Westuber in Germany. It's a really tubby little plant with a nice peristome and a very hairy lid. It's quite compact. Look at the pitcher to leaf ratio. I'm very gutted that I accidentally broke off the latest pitcher while removing sphagnum moss from the tank. This is a nice longer, narrower pot. I struggled to find these in South Africa, but Really, really handy for getting plants into tight spaces, but also giving a lot of space for root growth, because I find a lot of these plants root further down than they do sideways, so tall and narrow pots are fantastic for growing. I just really appreciate the lovely deep color on this one. Let's go find some more Nepenthes. Another big problem faced in growing in tanks, terrariums, and more closed spaces is moss. Not sphagnum moss, star moss. These little Nepenthes Albo Marginata were recently rescued from being buried, and the star moss is already back at hand. It's quite difficult to deal with. You can pull it with tweezers, or I think easier is to just repot the plants, which I should do soon. These are really cute little red Albo Marginatas. 
And the more you repot them, the faster they grow. They've been sitting here for a while. I think that's about time for a repot. Because when they sit here for a while, they really stall. And when we put them in a new pot, they get a massive growth spurt. So the, su the more often you can afford to repot these, the better. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting here pulling out star moss for years. The last Nepenthes I'd like to show off in the tank is this really cute little pot of Nepenthes Burbidinae cross velosa, bred by Jeremiah Harris. These are really cute little highland hybrids. Already two years old, so very slow, but showing teeth. These little sort of bicolor pictures. I'm super stoked to see how these turn out. I repotted these earlier this year, and you can see the new leaves already jumping for the skies. So it's really just a testament to how well repotting works for getting Nepenthes seedlings to grow quickly. I found for the bigger plants, once they're well established, I don't really mind sitting in their pot for a while. For these little ones, it makes a huge difference. The Hillyam Frail are also simply some of the most stunning carnivorous plants that are out there. They're related to Saracenia, the trumpet pitchers, but hail from the Tepuis of South America. These I'm growing mostly in pumice, as I showed earlier. You can see a little bit in the bottom here, since it drains so well. And also sphagnum moss grows very well on it, as does ferns, unfortunately. I pulled a lot of the moss out recently because it's burying the smaller plants. These Hillyamphora grow quite slowly. Some of the older pitchers are about this size in the middle. Now a year later, this is growing very nicely. I do feed them with organic fertilizer, something I'll speak about in another future video that I hope to make soon. I don't like disturbing these too much because they're very brittle. Hilly and free, look at them funny and a picture breaks off unfortunately. So I'm not going to show you too many of them. This is, I'm assuming a Newtons. I'm not entirely sure. I got it as a no ID. But regardless, it is spectacular. Get a good look. These beautiful nectar spoons on top here. So happy Helium 4 will have a good intact nectar spoon. You can see this is an older picture. When I acclimated it, the nectar spoon is a little rusty. And maybe this one as well. They kind of bum out when they don't have sufficient humidity. But the air movement is quite important for these, regardless. I water them in the pitchers from the top. Because the full, of the full pitchers are happy if they dry out too much through that, then they can stop getting really crispy and very unhappy with you. So always make sure to water your pitchers. One last Heliamphora that I simply must show off is Heliamphora McDonald A. This is one of the most sought after Heliamphora for the beautiful color that it gets in the pitchers. These lovely mottled patterns. This one is still quite young. So I'll throw some really nice pictures as it gets older. You can also see the immature pictures on the Helium 4 here. When they're at this stage, they're quite difficult to look after because it's difficult to water them. They're very fragile. Once they start making these nice mature pictures, they're typically much sturdier. And if they're stressed, like these ones were after import, they originally had a nice mature picture, but started making immature ones. And now we'll hopefully start making some nice big ones again. Yeah, I'll be very gentle with these. You can see they're very stiff. And you really don't want to break them. Otherwise you might cry, as I have in the past. And just to show the sphagnum moss is growing very nicely. It's also a good indicator of when to water. Because the moment the pumice, sphagnum moss underneath starts drying out, the sphagnum gets a lighter color. And then you can hit your sprayers again. But every so often you do have to thin it out. Otherwise it does bury the smaller plants. Particularly the nepenthes and the juvenile heliamphora. So that's it from the tropical tank. See if I have any nice pinguicula around, and then we can wrap this up. I think this plant here is really a testament to the beauty of pinguicula. From the tiny, cute little succulent leaves to the bright pink flowers and profusion. This Jamavensis, also I believe now synonymous with Estriana, as I mentioned, has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 flowers, with the 15th, 16th, and 17th that have already passed, 18, 19, 20 on their way from just three little plants. This one so far has been ridiculously easy to grow. It's flowered nicely and after winter time. And some of these plants are also starting to split now in two. This one in three, which often happens with pinguicula after their winter dormancy. As you can see in this pot, this is a pinguiculatina or ignata cross secari. This was one plant and now it's making nice carnivorous leaves, but it's split into three. So pinguicula often propagate quite nicely on their own without too much intervention needed. Or you can take leaf pullings as well. I really love this natural hybrid between Esseriana and Laxifolia, originally collected by Oliver Gluch in Europe in the Alcilo Mountains. This has a really delicate venation on the leaves. It's a faint pink with the darker red veins. 
This one's just waking up now from dormancy and it's looking spectacular. For the last plant of the day, here we have Pinguicula cyclosecta, another beautiful little Mexican species. With these dark purple edges on the leaves, this pot came from Diflora. Shout out Valera and the team for producing such cute plants. This is one that's also very highly sought after and not often available, at least in South Africa. And these tiny little plants came out of dormancy and are growing super well. So soon I'll repot them and hopefully they put on another growth spurt. So with that, I thank you for joining me on this tour of indoor growing and the guide. If you like this video, please like it on YouTube and subscribe if you want to see more carnivorous plant content. Until then, happy growing.